All right, we've started with a little bit of Chopin for today. Oh, I have to get my laser pointer. Because Chopin is, of course, of this period, and he gives us an interesting point of departure in honor of modern day Poland, which is where Chopin came from. I have put in the Polish flag. And that's why we have a little white and red variation here to sort of look like the flag as our, our, our sort of opening thing. Uh, there are many interesting things about Chopin. This particular piece, which was played by Vladimir Horowitz, the famous pianist, is called a Polonaise. It's a particular Polonaise. It's called the Heroic. Uh, it has been interpreted as being nationalist. It can also be interpreted as just following a particular format, but it fits with our theme for today of ideologies and our theme in particular of nationalism. Chopin, however, composed it in France because many Polish intellectuals lived in exile because there was no Poland. Poland having been partitioned in the 1770s and the 1790s between Austria, Prussia, and Russia ceased to exist and was a hotbed of revolt and revolution from the 1790s right up to 1918 when it became a nation in the settlement after World War I once again. In this period, Poland is directly, there is a kingdom of Poland set up after 1815 and it's under the control of the Tsar of Russia. So Chopin lives in Paris where he has a famous affair with Georges Sand, whose picture appears in the chapter, one of the most famous female intellectuals of the 19th century. She used the name Georges Sand in the English manner, without an S at the end of Georges, uh, as a pseudonym in which to publish her name. So women publishing was still, it wasn't completely problematic. Jane Austen published under her own name, but still. And then Chopin, also is an example of the kinds of diseases of this period. Cholera was the most famous, but tuberculosis was the biggest killer. There were no antibiotics until World War II. Therefore, if you got tuberculosis, you would be like those unfortunate people today who are getting back antibiotic resistant tuberculosis. There was no cure. And Chopin died, as you see, at the relatively young age of 39 of tuberculosis. But his Polonaise is a, is a wonderful reminder for us of how music is related to the politics of this period. Because some people interpreted it as being a Polonaise, Polonaise being the French for Polish, so it was the Polish, but it's also a musical form. Uh, Chopin was famous for his in particular for his piano compositions, and he himself was a great pianist. This is a period, the early 19th century, one of the things I love about it, there's a great book about this, called, I think it's called The Virtuoso. This is a period in which people are fascinated by the idea of individual genius that goes with Romanticism, and they're fascinated by great pianists. Liszt was a fantastic pianist uh, as well. He, Hungarian, in his case, also living in Paris much of this time. And this is, of course, the 1840s, which will be the center of our preoccupation today. OK. We're going to start with ideologies formed explicitly in reaction to the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. And we're going to start with those that favored Enlightenment ideas and the things that happened as a result of the French Revolution. And those in favor would be liberalism, socialism, and communism. Liberalism being the furthest to the right, if you will, the sort of center ideology, and socialism and communism developing further to the left. OK, what is liberalism? It is an ideology that places emphasis on freedom on liberties. Now, first thing to keep in mind, even though it's said in the textbook, let me repeat it. 
liberalism as an ideology in the 19th century is not what we mean today by liberalism. Indeed, in this country, to be a liberal is what? What, what does being a liberal stand for? Shane, you were going to say? Pardon me? It, more interested in change, OK? So more on the left than the liberalism of the 19th century, OK? To be a liberal, in other words, we're sort of in an, the, the words have changed meaning over time. In the United States of today, a 19th century liberal is really much more associated with a neo, what we call the neoconservative position, above all free market and individual rights. Free markets, free labor, that is, no unions. Free markets, free labor, and constitutional guarantees. Now, in the 19th century, this is an oppositional position because the traditional monarchical governments don't have constitutions, for the most part, don't offer constitutional guarantees of freedom of expression, freedom of religion, don't believe in free markets because they believe the government should have direct impact on the market to make sure peasants are not unhappy. So the context matters enormously. In the early 19th century, liberalism is an oppositional ideology. It is the people who endorse the principles of the Enlightenment and want to apply them to politics, but believe that the French Revolution goes too far. So I like to think of them as they're the people who like 1789. After 1789, executing the king, the terror, they reject completely. So pro-enlightenment, pro-1789. That's liberalism. Who would be a 19th century liberal from your reading in the textbook? Jeremy Bentham would be a perfect example in England in the early 19th century. He was also an abolitionist. And later on, we'll be reading about John Stuart Mill, the great mid-19th century spokesman of liberalism. OK, to the left of the liberals, we have the radical Democrats. That is, the people who believed that the revolution was good up through 1792. People like Thomas Paine in Great Britain, who, the hero of the American Revolution in 1776, who publishes Common Sense, the single most important pamphlet of the American Revolution. He's an Englishman, goes to the United States, goes back to England, goes to France when the revolution starts there, and is actually elected a deputy to the National Convention in 1792. He's a radical Democrat in that he opposes monarchy. His vindication of the rights of man, written in response to Burke's attack on the French Revolution that you have in the, te in the textbook document, Paine writes against Burke. He writes against conservatism and argues that monarchy is ridiculous. We only have monarchy because we've always had monarchy. Why should we do that? Instead, argues that we should have a republic in England, joins the Republicans in France, is in favor of greater equality, is in favor of universal manhood suffrage, a key demand for the radical Democrats all the way through the 19th century. In addition to Paine and, well, OK, I have Jeremy Bentham here as opposed to under liberalism, well, because he goes back and forth about which category he really belongs in, uh, because he is in favor of greater participation in politics. Paine and Bentham, it would also be true of the Chartists that we will talk about way too briefly today. The Chartists in England who mobilized through mass demonstrations and through trade unions to demand access to the vote for all men, something that doesn't happen in England until the end of the 19th century. So the Chartists are radical Democrats too. These are the people who like the revolution up to 1792, but resist the terror. In Paine's case, not surprising, because he's arrested because he supports the Girondin position in the French Revolution and therefore is considered too moderate 
insufficiently <laughs> radical and is in jail and is almost executed for his pains. Now, socialism then arises in the 18 teens and the 1820s. And basically, here we have more of a response. Yes, it is positive about the Enlightenment. Actually, the early socialists tend to see the French Revolution as something of a deviation, of a, of a detour from the real problem. Because in the 1820s, the socialists, the early socialists are saying, what really matters is work, the need to reorganize work with the rise of industrialization. So socialism takes shape in response to early industrialization. It uses the principles of the Enlightenment. Some of them are pro-French Revolution. Most of them think of the revolution as too involved with politics. What's needed is a reorganization of society. Now, the early socialists, Saint-Simon, Fourier in France, and Owen in England, actually gets his start in Scotland, are emphasizing the need to find, to re refine, to rediscover social harmony. They're saying industrialization is creating an upheaval in the world as we know it. What we need is to reestablish social harmony, get rid of the conflict between workers and employers, and the way to do it, according to the early socialists, is to set up model communities. Now, this leads to really interesting developments. In the case of Owen, he actually moves to Indiana, where he can get the land to set up a model community called New Harmony, Indiana, not surprisingly, which fails because inevitably people end up fighting amongst themselves in the new model community. Followers of Saint-Simon and followers of Fourier both try to set up model communities. In the case of the Saint-Simonians, a group of them end up in Egypt trying to set up a model community. And the thing about these early socialists who are incredibly interesting is that they are in many ways the origin of a modern phenomenon known as the cult. They get into sort of small groups of true believers, especially of Sansimonianism, and they try to apply their principles within a kind of enclosed community. They get into some weird ideas. For the time, it was considered weird, for example, to believe in free love, which is one of their tenets. They believed in women's liberation. They had newspapers. They had communities. They didn't want a proletarian revolution like Marx. Okay? They wanted to remake society from the ground up through these new communities. So they're very much like the hippie communities of the 1960s. They're, in some ways, the ancestor of the kibbutz in Israel. So they are the ancestor of a, of a, a lot of interesting modern phenomena, despite the fact that they didn't have that much influence at the time, except in giving much greater currency to this notion of socialism. It is Saint-Simon who, who introduces the term industrial revolution. The industrial is a Saint-Simonian term. These are the people who introduce the notion of socialism. And what is socialism to them? It is that we must remake the social order and not expect political change to be able to do this. Okay? They want to do it through the modes of production. They want to do it through consumer cooperatives and producer cooperatives. So they want to reorganize labor, reorganize work, that is, and social life as a way of remaking society under this new influence of industrialization. OK. So that's early socialism. Marx has nothing but disdain for these early socialists. Marx, when he establishes, he is not the first person to use the word communist. The first person to use it in 1840, what meant by it a further development of these kinds of social communities. 
But when Marx picks up the term, which first used in 1840, he gives it great currency. And he establishes a program that is very different from the early socialists. So communism is a subset of socialism. Okay? When we say socialism, it actually includes communism. But the communists push away from their socialist roots and argue that there is only one possible way to get this reorganization of work and society, and that is through a political revolution. So they take from the French Revolution the notion of revolution. Now, don't sit there thinking, because this is not the point. I'm not saying what you should have said in your paper, because you were dealing with what was in the words of the Communist Manifesto. I'm talking all of Marx up to his death in 1883 and how the theory develops in the 19th century. This is not what you were expected to do. Do not compare your paper to what I am saying and feel like you have to go out and go to bed immediately because you feel horrible. Okay? I know that feeling. Trust me, I've had that feeling many times in the past myself. Okay. So what Marx and Engels are doing are saying is these early socialists, the problem with them is they're just utopian dreamers. They think they're going to go out and form a little community and remake the world from the bottom up. No. The way to remake the world, they will argue, is through an international organization of the working class, which they will only form in 1863, so it is not there in the Communist Manifesto, and a kind of super union of trade unions will be the start, and then there will have to be an uprising of all these workers to take control of the state, and the state will take control of the means of production, and this will happen through a political revolution. So Marx and Engels take from the Enlightenment the notion that reason reveals these truths. They take from the French Revolution the key element that it requires a revolution to do this, but they differ from both of these in, in seeing, as the socialists saw before them in the 1820s and 1830s, that the entire world is changing because of this new industrial process. There are factories where there were not factories before. What happens in the factories? The workers are together. What does that mean? The workers can develop consciousness of their situation. They can organize themselves in what will be called trade unions during the 19th century. And ultimately, they will act politically. So this is the way in which Marx and Engels so brilliantly say that the proletarian revolution will come out of capitalism itself. What does capitalism do? After it defeats the aristocracy, after the bourgeoisie defeats the aristocracy, it sets up the factory system. What does the factory system do? It makes the workers miserable, but it brings them together. Capitalism digs its own grave by bringing the workers together. So they take these ideas, but they go in a radically new direction with them. Okay. Now, the ideologies that oppose the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. You will know if you've looked at your email that I have sent you an email about the midterm. <clears throat> the questions are hard, I admit it. On the other hand, you've got them all ahead of time, so you know how to guide your studying. And one of those questions is about conservatism. Because though in my heart of hearts, I am obviously attracted to the Enlightenment, the French Revolution, liberalism, socialism, and even, to a certain extent, communism. I think it has to be admitted that conservatism is an incredibly powerful ideology, both intellectually, there is much to be said about it as a coherent intellectual formulation, and certainly politically, because in the period 1815 to 1848, Conservatism has a very powerful hold on all of society. We see this from the 
Metternichs on down through, this is a period of enormous religious revival, for example. Religious revival which has very little interest in political change. Some of it does. Those people who support abolitionism obviously want to abolish slavery. OK. Oh, you see, I've gotten really into these little um, bubble things. Uh, and now you'll have to deal with it over time. OK, the great theorist of conservatism you read a little tiny snippet of in the textbook, and that's Edmund Burke. Now, of course, this is part of why I think the French Revolution has so much influence. What leads to the formulation of conservatism? The French Revolution. Edmund Burke sees 1789. In 1790, he writes the single most important text of conservatism in his Reflections on the Revolution in France. He sees 1789, and he already sees that there has been a major challenge to the way the world is organized. And so in a rather rambling, if you read the whole book, it's, the pamphlet's like 250 pages long at least. It's all available online. It's an unbelievably fantastic piece of writing about what's wrong with the French Revolution. You get a little hint of it in, your, in, your, in, in the document inside the contrasting views part in the textbook chapter. But basically, here's Burke's view. What makes society and pol politics work? In his view, you have to be emotionally attached to the society you live in, to the people who govern you. What's wrong with the French Revolution? It wants to apply the, the Enlightenment principles and reduce everything to calculation of self-interest. Reason is cold, says Burke. It's a cold vision. That you're going to, and what is, the, what is the outcome of this cold vision? That you have to use violence to maintain power. So instead of getting people to obey because they love the king and the queen, because they're watching everything that they do, because their aristocratic betters are taking care of them, and they live in a society of harmony and deference to your superiors. Instead, it's a society of egotistical calculation, of only doing things in your self-interest, and you will return David, you'll remember this from the cluster. You will return to the Hobbesian world of the war of all against war, and power will maintain itself exclusively through the threat and the reality of violence. So the conservative view is a powerful view because it takes as its immediate proposition that people don't inherently want to obey their government. And the question is, What's the best basis of obedience? The conservatives say it's love, it's being attracted to the system that you live in, it's understanding your place in society, and it's understanding that change, if it comes slowly, is OK, but otherwise is disruptive. The Enlightenment and the French Revolution instead are arguing the only good basis for politics is consent and political participation. It's a completely different vision. Okay? The conservative vision is you don't have to participate because there are other people there to participate for you, i.e., those in the higher ranks. And government will look out for the people. And as long as the people are happy, everything will be okay. Okay, so they're very, very, very different views. Uh, and of course, it's not that conservatives didn't believe in the need for power. So we have this famous, I love this quote from Metternich. I had to give it to you here. In me you see Europe's grand minister of police. Metternich was not a fool. He didn't think that people were going to obey after the French Revolution just because they felt positively about their government. After all, Napoleon had chased away all those rulers. Now you had to justify bringing them back. Metternich's, the big lesson that Metternich learns from Napoleon is that you need to have a secret police. Napoleon invents the secret police as a kind of organized arm of government, that you have to have people out there looking for dissidents 
and making sure you nip any possible conspiracy in the bud. Metternich picks up on that idea and establishes a secret police system. And Metternich, it has to be said, is obsessed in this period with the notion that there are secret conspiracies. He's obsessed because there are Freemason lodges, because there are now, on the model of Freemason lodges, all kinds of secret societies <coughs> beginning to form who are going to agitate for constitutional changes. You see it in his document, in his letter to the Tsar, that he is deeply worried about this connection between conspiracy and constitutional ideas. Metternich doesn't just expect people to obey. He's going to have a secret police looking for conspiracies everywhere. And just a little, going a little bit backward to Beethoven, you remember, who we listened to in connection with Napoleon. Beethoven was alive and in Vienna when Metternich was there. He was there during the Congress of Vienna in 1814-1815. And I love this. Beethoven's opera Fidelio was played for the heads of state and the leading diplomats during the Congress of Vienna. So it's not as if Beethoven was seen as some kind of radical, even though he himself believed in, he was, he was himself a liberal, in fact. Still, his music will be played for the heads of state. And what I love about this is apparently they didn't realize that Fidelio is actually based on a French revolutionary play from the late 1790s that Beethoven takes over and makes into the plot of his opera Fidelio. OK. And then this is in the textbook. I just thought we should linger on it a moment, because this is the conservative view of what's wrong with the French Revolution. You see our lovely French person here, as I say, is this, this is clearly supposed to be a woman, but it's a woman, OK, let's look at this, her face. What would we say about this woman, other than the fact that she's eating turnips, typical British view of the French, when they're not eating frogs' legs, they're eating turnips. Uh, what's, what's, with this, what's with this woman? What would we say about her? She's ugly, and I, but in what, what, is, what is her ugliness consist of? What is it that's ugly about her? Yes, what is your name? Nick? Nick? Emaciated. She's emaciated, but it's not just that. I mean, look at her. Does she, she doesn't exactly. What is your name? Uh, Paul. Paul. Great. She's masculinized. What's unattractive about her is, as I say, can you even tell that it's a woman? She has masculine features. This is the great conservative complaint about the French Revolution, that women are involved in it and that they're harpies, that they're violent, ugly, furious, out of control, hysterical. And they're literally referred to as having hysterical uteruses. And Burke starts this. Burke is crazed about the women who march to Versailles in October 1789 and bring back the king and queen. He describes in that work seeing the queen at Versailles before the revolution as a glittering orb around, that threw off light on all those around her. And he contrasts her and that society with the vile, masculinized, out of control, screaming harpies that bring the royal family back to Paris. But notice Gilray, he's a little tricky here. Here's the English guy. OK, does he look real attractive? What's wrong with him? He's a, he's a glutton. He, he's fat, but he's a glutton. He's eating what is the typical English food? Roast beef and Yorkshire pudding. And here he is having a piece of roast beef beyond all possible conception, unless you go to the Sunday night dinner at the grill on the alley in Beverly Hills, where they serve rather large portions of prime rib, too. OK, this is French liberty. Look at what he called This is British slavery. In other words, this, he says, is the French view. But he's got a little, little criticism there, I would say, of the English themselves. OK, other ideologies that are not directly related to the French Revolution and the Enlightenment would be nationalism 
and Romanticism. Now, nationalism, arguably, is the most important ideology of the 19th century. Let's be real. Marx in 1848 is an unknown. When he and Engels published the Communist Manifesto, there is no Marxism. There isn't really even communism in 1848. They're unknown. They're in trouble with the police. Metternich's police, to be exact. They're even in trouble with the police in Paris and the police in Brussels, where they end up in the course of 1848. They're just part of a general lunatic fringe on the left, as far as the authorities are concerned, of no particular importance. What is going to be obviously important during the entire 19th century, and indeed right up to our day, is nationalism. Now, the single most important thing to know about nationalism, and I will talk about it some more next Tuesday, the single most important thing to know about it is that it starts as a left-wing ideology. It, gets, it really heats up in the course of the French Revolution. The French use nationalism to cement their new armies, made up of draftees, who are now not fighting for the king, they are fighting for la nation, the nation. And that gets nationalism going. They're fighting for the nation. Now, of course, Napoleon muddies the water, because who does he take to Moscow with him amongst his five or 600,000 troops? Oh, yes, he takes French draftees, but he also takes Poles, and Prussians, and Italians, and various people that he's forced to join his armies by conquering their territories. So he muddies the water. And in response to Napoleon, we get the rise of nationalism in Italy, and especially the German states, in response against the French. Well, if the French have a nation, we should have a nation. So it begins first, it's allied what is allied at the beginning is liberals and nationalists. They want constitutions, and they want nations. There is no better example of this than Poland, which gets a new constitution in 1791, only to have it taken away by the Russians not, not, not much later, and that is the end of the Polish nation. Constitutions and nationhood go together at the beginning. Increasingly in the 19th century, as we will see, all too quickly, in a couple of weeks, nationalism will become a right-wing ideology, which it is to this day. But it begins as a way of involving everybody, and therefore it has inevitable left-wing connotations, because it has to do with participation. It has to do with equality, being part of the nation together. Only later will it take this right-wing form. OK. And then Romanticism is not an ideology. It's a movement in art and literature. We've talked about it a little. That emphasizes all the good things I have down here. Feeling, sensation, color, movement, history, nature, individual genius rather than reason. And the Enlightenment, progress, rationality are all problematic, according to Romanticism. There are Romantics who are nationalist. There are Romantics who are liberals. There are romantics who are socialists, like Georges Sand, who is very attracted to the socialist version. And there are romantics who are conservatives. It doesn't have a necessary political affiliation. As you know from reading the caption, I know you've studied the captions of all the pictures really carefully, uh, because I spent so much time composing them. When I was in London a couple of years ago, I was at the National gallery, and I saw this painting, the Joseph Turner, which you have in the book. The Fighting Temeraire, that's the wooden ship, tugged to her last berth to be broken up, tugged by a tugboat that is powered by a steam engine. I'm sorry, the picture on this, the, the lighting is so bad. I have, to, I, have to, I, have to, I have to do a little better here. So you get a sense of it. This is a fantastic picture. Anyway, when I was there, there was a little caption, which is now in the textbook, that said there had been a recent poll 
in Great Britain about what was the single greatest British painting ever. And this one. I thought that was so interesting. From the, from the early 19th century, not from later, 1838, Turner here is mourning the loss of the old society, the wooden sailing, sailing ships, this is a three-masted schooner, being towed away by a steam-driven tugboat, the new society. It's going to be broken up for its wood. But in the meantime, so it's about, romanticism is often about nostalgia for the world, the world of harmony that has been lost with the rise of industrialization, with the Enlightenment and the French Revolution and this emphasis on reason. It's about nostalgia for a world in which feeling and emotion and color was much more important. Now, what's so interesting about Turner, let, just remember this fabulous cloud at sunset and this wonderful shimmering water, because Turner is so clearly the forefather of Impressionism, of the breaking apart of the emphasis on clean lines, clear lines, on rational composition. And the Impressionists will take this to the next step and will say, painting is nothing but color and light. It's not about the representation of reality itself. Turner is that first step. OK, change gears. So conservatives is a powerful explanation about the way the world should be. But after 1815 and the defeat of Napoleon and pushing France back to its original borders, conservatism and all of these pent up demands for change are locked in a life and death struggle. What is interesting overall about this struggle is that Metternich will win. He's in power as chancellor of the Austrian emperor for an incredibly long time. He will win between 1815 and 1848, and then he will lose in the great upheaval of 1848. He will not come back, but the rulers will come back. OK. So we've already seen in the Metternich document the need to keep a, a, a lid clamped on all of this demand for constitutional change, which he associates with revolution, anarchy, and social breakdown. But as I say, look at all that orange. Even in the 1820s, this is not entirely successful. It's, OK, here's how it works. We don't need to know exactly all of the things that happened in the 1820s. Bottom line is there are outbreaks of demands for constitutional government that take the form of revolts. They don't become successful revolutions in that those revolting don't get control of the government. Metternich and the other powers will intervene to prevent that from happening. And so Spain, 1820s, major revolt of army officers, many of whom are in Freemason lodges, who want constitutional government, demand it of the restored king. He calls in the French. The French come in with the support of the Congress powers uh, with Metternich's consent. They put down the revolt, restore the king to power. However, that opens the door explicitly to all those Latin American independence movements. Metternich can restore the king in Spain. He can't restore the king's power in South America, which is definitively lost then in the 1820s. Oh, there will be a series of uprisings in the Italian states against their Austrian controllers. And these will fail in the 1820s and in the 1830s and in the 1840s. And we will talk next week about how independence in Italy and national unification is finally achieved. Even Russia has a revolt in this period. Russia, where basically no news of the American Revolution was ever allowed to be printed because it was thought to be too dangerous. No connections with France were allowed in the 1790s, even though it's Catherine the Great who is the czar in, in the early period of the revolution. 
Under Nicholas I, as we'll see, see later, there is a complete clampdown using a secret police network that's now going to be well developed. Nevertheless, before Nicholas comes to power, when the Tsar dies, there is a moment when things might have changed. Army officers want the brother, Constantine, to be put in power instead because he's more liberal, more constitution-minded. That fails. The officers are tried and executed. The one place where revolt will succeed is in the Greek revolt against their Ottoman rulers. Now, keep in mind, the Ottomans control all of Greece, much of Bulgaria, and, and parts still of Hungary and certainly of Serbia, uh, Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Montenegro, etc. They control loosely all of this territory. The Greeks begin to revolt. They get support from intellectuals in the West. And most importantly, Britain and France decide it would not be such a bad thing for the Greeks to be independent. Metternich cannot prevent this from happening because the French and the British are in favor of it, because the Greeks have support throughout Europe, public opinion, and because it involves the Turks, who after all are not Christian and are seen as enemies of Christian Europe. Metternich does not want Greek independence because he thinks it will encourage bad behavior in other places, but he fails. He does succeed in the other places. Then in 1830, we have another series of revolts, this one more serious. Uh, here we have the French flag up here so that you'll see it, red, white, and blue, the tricolor, which is revived in 1830, having been suppressed after 1815. It had been the national flag, starting with the French Revolution. Now it come back, comes back in 1830, when Louis XVI's second brother, Charles X, is overthrown. He goes to England. He is not executed. His cousin comes to the throne, and the French get a constitutional monarchy with slightly more liberal voting under Louis Philippe, whose name you will not be asked to remember. Same time in 1830, the Belgians revolt against the Kingdom of the Netherlands, the Dutch, and get their independence because France and Britain will support it. Poland revolts, Italian states revolt. They fail because they do not have support, uh, for the most part, except from France. Now this leads the way then to the massive set of uprisings in 1848. Now, I wish we had a lot more time to go into the details of 1848. We're going to just do a tiny bit of detail on 1848. What you need to remember about 1848 is the question that was famously asked by historians for a hundred years afterwards. Was this the turning point in European history that failed to turn? Had they reached a moment when democracy could have been installed by revolutionary means, and instead it failed? And if it failed, why did it fail? Now, the biggest thing to notice about the revolutions of 1848 is simply how widespread revolt is. There are major revolts, first in Palermo, which doesn't have much resonance, in February in Paris, which gets everybody agitated. When the French revolt, memories come back. Kings lose their heads, there are terrors, there's Jacobins, there's an entirely different vision of the world possible. Once again, France goes into revolt in February 1848. Louis Philippe is forced to leave the country. He too goes to England, as Charles X did before him. He is not executed. Universal manhood suffrage is reinstituted. A republic, the second republic now, is established. And there is immediately great worry about, will the Second Republic repeat the First? Are we going to get increasingly radical? Are we going to get a Robespierre? 
Are we going to end up with a Napoleon? Well, yes, it turns out we are going to end up with a Napoleon, but we will get to that in a minute. Everyone is in a state of expectation that this has happened in Paris. In March, it happens in Berlin. It happens in Vienna. And not long after, it's happening in Italian cities. And it's happening in Prague. There is revolution in the air. It is a revolutionary springtime. Not unlike the spring of 1968, 120 years later. But this one is much more violent. Now, so we want to notice how many places this is happening. I left out Warsaw and Krakow, where, of course, they want Polish independence. I left out Budapest, which are two, actually two different cities on the side, uh, either side of the Danube. I left out, well, Frankfurt isn't really so much a revolt, but Munich, certainly another place. And of course, Rome, I mentioned in passing. Everywhere, there are things going on. The big difference now is this is general in Europe. It's not just France. France is the, the spark that sets this off but it's now happening in all these other places too. Now, we're not going to go through each one of these stories. They all take a similar shape. First, there are armed revolts. Well, actually, you go back a step. The February and March ones start with peaceful demonstrations against the government, usually asking for constitutions, or broadening of the suffrage. More men should get to vote. It starts in Paris with a banquet campaign that's canceled by the government as too dangerous, and instead there are street demonstrations. It starts with massive demonstrations. And by the way, huge numbers of revolutions start with demonstrations in the street. It's why it's still such a popular form of protest today, because you can't predict where a demonstration is going to end. Well, in Paris and in Berlin and Vienna, they end with the governments collapsing. How does this happen? It happens because there's a demonstration. In each of the three cities, it takes a very similar form. Massive demonstrations asking for constitutional change. The troops are brought out to maintain order. And inevitably, this is what happens in demonstrations, happened at Kent State in 1970. Inevitably, someone on the government side fires. They feel threatened. They're pushed. The crowd is getting too close. People die. In the case of Berlin, the next day, the demonstrators carry the dead bodies in coffins underneath the king's window, and he gives up. He basically collapses and says, OK, you know, let them take over. And he basically leaves town and goes to regroup elsewhere in Prussia. So in each case, the central authority collapses because it loses its legitimacy when this massive public demonstration ends in violence. So in all cases, new governments take over. That's the next stage. Then the issue is, what are these governments going to do? And what has happened because of industrialization is that there are new demands. In France, the tension will be between constitutional reform, we're going to have a republic, we're going to have universal manhood suffrage, we're going to have political change, and the demand for social action. The 1840s are a bad time at the end of the 1840s. There's the Irish famine. Everywhere else, there's food shortages. People want the government to provide social relief. So there are social demands now that are appearing because of industrialization and because people are just more sensitive to social tensions. Look in your textbook, the document from Tocqueville, on the June days of 1848, Tocqueville is sort of between a conservative and a liberal. He's an aristocrat who's in favor of the republic. He describes the June days of 1848 as if he were Marx. He describes it as a period of class conflict. 
everyone's worried about the social question. So in France, there's the tension between social change and political change. In the German states, there's a tension between political change, social change, and then the new element, national unification. Similarly, in Vienna, there is a tension between having a Republican form of government or a constitutional monarchy and more political participation, or having changes that are positive for the workers, social relief, attention to the social question, or third thing, what are the different nationalities in the empire going to get out of this? Briefly, what happens is that these tensions prove to be incompatible in 1848. In France, it takes the most dramatic form, something that Marx will write about extensively at the moment. Marx publishes the Communist Manifesto in early 1848, before things have really gotten hot. He is there, he's not in Paris, but he's in Brussels and then he's in London, seeing it unfold. What happens in France? There's a new National Assembly which raises taxes on the peasants, which makes them really furious. It institutes universal manhood suffrage and the workers are clamoring for relief. They set up national workshops to provide public assistance, a kind of incipient welfare program. They're, it attracts thousands of workers to Paris to get this work and relief combination. Authorities become afraid of this and they shut down the national workshops. This leads the workers of these workshops to arm themselves and actually fight the government. The great thing about the Tocqueville quote is, at the end of it he says, okay, we brought, so we brought in the peasants from the countryside to help us defend the liberal republic against the workers. And how did they get to the capital? On the railroad. Okay, so the conservative forces flocked to Paris to fight the workers. The government, but keep in mind, it's the republic fighting the workers, not the old monarchy, the new republic is forced to fight the workers over what kind of republic it's going to be. The workers lose, thousands are killed, and even more thousands are arrested and thrown into prison, later tried, and many of them are sent through transportation to French colonies whether in South America and Guyana or in Algeria. Some are in prison, but some are just sent off to other places. So there is a total breakdown of the Republic within France. And what emerges in the course of this is the building of barricades against government troops. And I show you this, notice, I show you this because it will become a phenomenon all during the 19th and 20th century in France and in many other places. You take carts that you find on the street to build these barricades. What are all these things here? Cobblestones, exactly. They are what used to be on the street. This turns out to be the big problem. Oh, yes, of course, you know, because it says here the problem with having cobblestones to pave your streets. Okay. I show you this because of the barricades, but I show you this also because it's a photograph. The daguerreotype is invented at the end of the 1830s. Many people are working on the sort of early forms of photography. This is one of the few things that can be successfully photographed in the 1840s because the exposure is like not a sixth of a second, not 60 seconds but like 20 minutes that you have to hold the camera in place. So this is ideal. You notice there are no people and there's no movement. So you, it's just the thing itself. And this will be very common in photographs, the early photographs of the 1830s and especially 1840s. Just to show you how this endures, May 68, the student uprising in Paris. What form does it take? The government obviously 
has tried to get those cobblestones hidden beneath an asphalt surface, but they have not succeeded. Look how they have dug it up and built a barricade much like the barricades of 1848. So this is a repertory of revolt that will remain. OK. Now, if we went back to the map, we would want to look at the places where revolution does not happen. But you have the map enough in mind, especially after the map quiz, that when I say England and Russia, you know they're on the two ends of Europe. The two places that don't have an uprising, other than Spain, which is now under such tight control that nothing is allowed to happen, the two places that ha do not have revolutions in 1848 are England and Russia. Now, this is fascinating. And it tells us something extremely important about revolution. England has the most progressive political structure at the time. And Russia has the least progressive political structure at the time. People revolt when they have expectations. They do not revolt when they are completely oppressed. The most dangerous situation for a ruling party or for a ruler is to encourage expectation of change. So it's the countries in between. It's Prussia, it's Austria, it's the Italian states, it's the West German states, it's France that have revolutions. The English do not have a revolution because they make concessions. In 1832, there's a reform bill that expands the vote to the new industrial cities. Admittedly, only to the really well-off property owners of the new industrial cities, but still. The system showed itself capable of reform. Starting in the 1830s and in the 1840s, there is the massive mobilization called Chartism in England, especially, and also in the rest of Great Britain. Millions are involved in Chartism. Now, this is also an interesting point, and I don't have it down on the slide, but this is an important point. The English are the first to allow the formation of trade unions. Now, we still have controversy about trade unions. Is it the fault of the UAW that GM and Chrysler are in trouble? Or is it because they have such high wages and they get such great benefits? They're not so badly paid as the workers of the South who work for Toyota. Is it their fault that we're in trouble, or is it the fault of the people who run GM and Chrysler who seemed incapable of ever learning anything from renting a Japanese car? At least that's the way I always felt. Um, I grew up with American cars, but I even managed to convince my staggeringly conservative Minnesota parents to buy a Toyota at some point. Uh, so we still have controversies about this. In the 19th century, we have the idea of a trade union. That is that the workers should organize together to demand better conditions. Remembering that in 1844 in Berlin, workers start at 6 AM and end at 7 PM. What it didn't say is six days a week, not five. Okay. In the 19th century, trade unions are illegal in every single European country until 1824, Great Britain allows the formation of trade unions. So trade unions are allowed in Britain 30 years before they're allowed anywhere else. They are illegal in the entire rest of Europe. And you could trace a history from west to east of trade unionism, just as you can tra trace the same history of literacy, of industrialization, of constitutional forms of government. 1824, the English allow trade unions. So there are trade unions. The Chartist movement is the mobilization of the various trade unions to demand universal manhood suffrage. They end up with a petition of one million signatures carried by a massive demonstration to the Houses of Parliament in 1848. And it's turned down. Do the workers then 
riot? No. Do they cause a revolution? No. And the reason is there has been some responsiveness. There's the 1832 Reform Bill, and there's the, most importantly, perhaps the 1846 repeal of the Corn Law, it's called. You don't need to remember that, because we're not going to ask it of you. You know that already, because it's not one of the IDs. Repeal of the Corn Law, which was a tariff on imported wheat. They repealed the tariff so that imported wheat could be brought in more cheaply, which would be better for the working class because food would be cheaper. So it shows flexibility. They're willing to have trade unions, which every other government in Europe considers so dangerous, they are illegal. So try to, try to imagine this. This is what is so important in understanding the labor movement. It's not even possible to have a meeting and form an organization in most countries in Europe until the end of the 19th century. It's earlier in France, it's France, it's 1863. So trade unions in this period are a very fraught notion. Okay, so the English have shown flexibility. Nicholas I shows no flexibility. And that works equally well, it turns out. He's czar for an incredibly long period of time. And he has an absolutely iron fist. The slightest sign of dissent, and you are sent to Siberia. This is when Siberia is invented as a form of punishment, is under Nicholas I. There is complete control over all expression of opinion. There are, needless to say, no trade unions. It's even problematic to have meetings of any kind that imply organization. So most discussion of criticism takes place in informal evenings of people getting together and talking about how, how Russia needs to change. Nicholas I doesn't just have an iron fist at home. He will be the key element in suppressing the revolutions of Eastern Europe. The Russian army will defeat the Hungarians who are revolting against the Austrians and help restore the Austrian emperor. So he plays a key role in defeating the revolutions. OK, why do the 1848 revolutions fail? The June days, the workers are defeated. Then the republic has an election. It's a single house legislature again, as it was under the first French Revolution has an election for a president. And there's this weird candidate that everyone makes fun of, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, the German-speaking nephew of the first Napoleon. Oh, he tried a putsch earlier in the 1830s. That failed miserably. He was considered so pathetic they didn't even keep him in prison for very long. He was considered a laughingstock like his uncle, did not speak French correctly, seemed to be, he was, by the way, deeply influenced by Saint-Simonianism. That made him seem even more weird to some people. Everybody thought they could control him. Now, you might have said, how short can your memory be? You thought you were going to control the first one, too. He was short and spoke with an Italian or Corsican accent. This guy's pudgy, not so short. Uh, and speaks with a German accent, and you think you're going to control him. Wrong. He gets elected president. He then has a coup three years later so that he can become, be re-elected president and is essentially now going to be president for life. And then guess what? On the anniversary of his uncle's coronation, he gets himself crowned Emperor Napoleon III. So the French Revolution now has Marx to comment on it. Marx is, needless to say, just thrown into a tizzy by this. The workers have revolted and failed. The workers then vote for Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. He's at least not the republic that suppressed them. He's the new guy. He's offering something to everybody. The peasants vote for him because the republic has raised their taxes. The workers vote for him because the republic has defeated them in the streets of Paris. And he becomes Napoleon III, who actually institutes a number of reforms and unlike his uncle, 
is not a warmonger. And we will talk about him a little bit more next week because he does a lot of actually quite interesting things. Marx, viewing this, says, how did this happen? So he has his famous line in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, a book he wrote about the coming to power of Louis Napoleon. He was so worried by it. He said, history repeats itself. The first time in the French Revolution, it's a tragedy. They're copying the Roman Republic. But their version is a tragedy. The second time when history repeats itself, it's as a farce. For him, Louis Napoleon was a farce. He got to power by offering liquor and sausages <laughs> to the people who became his kind of personal military guard. And he saw him as just, you know, a sign of a serious issue about working class consciousness. OK, what happens in the rest? In Prussia, the revolt gets caught up in the demand for national unification and the formation of a new Germany. A parliament is being held in Frankfurt with representatives of all the German states. They have a terrible time deciding whether they should have, have just a constitutional reform, a new Germany, or social reforms. They finally develop a constitution for a unified Germany and ask the restored king of Prussia to become the emperor of the new German state. And he replies, I don't take crowns from the gutter. He's come back to power. He is not going to be the king of unified Germany offered to him by a parliament of professors in Frankfurt. He instead will become the head of a Germany under very different circumstances. It falls apart then between the political and the social, the attempts to nationalize, and the attempts to get a more constitutional form of government. In the Habsburg Empire, in Austria, that is, similarly, divisions between the social and the political, and here complicated by the issue of Germany. Is Austria going to be part of the new Germany? Is it a German-speaking area? No, because the Austrian Empire includes Slovenes, Croats, Hungarians, you name it, Czechs, uh, Slovakians, all Bosnians, all the different kinds of people who are in that part of Europe are part of the Austrian Empire, and they are all now fighting each other. Frankfurt is for the Germans, and the Czechs say, well, what about us? So they try to have a pan-Slav Congress, but can there be a pan-Slav state? That will be one of the issues that will bedevil Europe all the way up to 1918. So finally, the lessons of failure. Marx was half right. Class conflict would fuel revolution, but it would also defeat it. Without a unified front, revolution did not work. Revolutions, second lessons, revolutions fail without the support of the peasantry. This worried Marx a lot because most Europeans were peasants. The peasants supported Louis Napoleon. So in his book on Louis Napoleon, Marx has his famous analysis of the peasantry. The peasantry are like potatoes in a sack. They're just individual potatoes. Workers form organizations that transform their consciousness. So for him, peasants lived in what he called elsewhere the idiocy of rural life. They just were politically impossible. But you couldn't make a, good, a successful one without them. And in 1848, the Austrian Empire emancipates the serfs, thus removing the peasants from the revolutionary equation. And then finally, and most importantly, nationalism works as much against revolution as it can work in favor of revolution. And as we will see next week, the new nation states will be formed not by revolution, but by warfare. And we will see how that works. <laughs>